One cannot at the same time bemoan the populist critique and lament about inequality. If our representative institutions work the way they should have worked, the way they were expected to work, we would not have had the inequality that we do. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. Democracy is valued by many people because it enables us to achieve freedom and political equality in addition to numerous economic and social goals. But democracy also allows us to decide from time to time by whom we wish to be governed. Through elections, we can place in office those we expect to like, but also remove from office those we do not like. My guest argues that the essence of democracy is that it processes in relative liberty and peace whatever conflicts that arise in society. And elections are the main mechanism by which conflicts are managed. This is because elections generate temporary winners and losers designated by specific rules. Elections peacefully process conflicts when the losers do not find their defeat too painful and if they expect to have a reasonable chance of winning in the future. This also means that the winners do not inflict too much pain on the losers and do not foreclose the possibility of being removed from office. Adam Przewski is Emeritus Professor of Politics at New York University and one of the world's foremost scholars on democracy. He has studied political regimes, democracy, autocracy, and their intermediate forms, the conditions under which regimes survive and change, as well as their consequences for economic development and income equality. Adam's latest book is Crises of Democracy, where he discusses the political situation in established democracies, places this in the context of past misadventures of democratic regimes, and speculates on the future of democracy. I hope you enjoy our conversation. It's so good to see you, Adam. Welcome to the show. I appreciate it. Let's start with a brief overview of how you, as one of the democracy gurus in the world, how you view democracy because it is often assumed that democracy is of intrinsic value we like the smell of democracy and freedom but it also has instrumental value that it leads uh, leaders to actually understand what citizens want and demand and therefore better address their needs in much of your work of course you've operated with very succinct precise definitions of democracy i thought i would basically um just for the benefit of the listeners say that one of the many definitions that you have provided is that democracy is a political arrangement in which people select governments through elections and have a reasonable possibility of removing incumbent governments they do not like and in the latest book that you have crises of democracy you have a similar version of a uh, definition of democracy where democracy is simply a system in which incumbents lose elections and leave when they do so adam over the years you've been studying democracy and there are so many different understandings and definitions can you briefly tell us how your understanding of democracy has evolved and how did you get to this so sort the of very precise definition of democracy as i've just described well i've been trying to both analyze what are the values that democracy can possibly realize and i have been thinking about how it works as a mechanism my point of departure which is perhaps different from many other theorists is that democracy is a mechanism for processing whatever conflicts that may exist in a society i've been very influenced by first the 
Austrian constitutionalist Hans Kelsen, and then very much by Joseph Schumpeter, 1942 book, both of whom basically say that the original conception of representative government was based on the assumption of harmony of interests, that people can be united around some common goal, common interest, public interest, whatever these things are called. And both Kelsen and Schumpeter say, well, the problem is that they will disagree. Even if they agree about the goals, they will still disagree about the message. So we need some kind of a mechanism by which these conflicts can be handled. And the conflicts, they are ubiquitous. Some are big, like conflicts over distribution of income, perhaps conflicts around some moral values. Some are very small and yet evoke intense passions. There was a Weimar government which fell over the issue of the color of the flag. My favorite example is a debate in France whether the soccer players on the national team must be forced to sing the Marseillaise because one of the players, Nicolas Anelka, said, well, but the Marseillaise says, aux armes les citoyens, to arms, citizens to arms. So he says, I'm a pacifist, I will not sing it. And it was passionate. So how are conflicts processed? And the main mechanism for me are elections. They're not the only mechanisms. We have collective bargaining systems. We have courts. So there are other mechanisms for processing conflicts. But the main one in which, in principle, all citizens have an equal right, if not possibly, to participate are elections. So I started, one, trying to analyze how do elections process conflicts, under what conditions, and then, and this is my quote-unquote minimalist theory of democracy, I started asking, so what other goals can we expect elections to realize? And I've come up with a very minimalist conclusion, which is perhaps due to Karl Popper and then Novetto Bobbio, namely that the main virtue of elections is that they allow us to process conflicts in liberty and peace. I want to ask you about this distinction between the minimalist and more substantive forms of democracy. As you just mentioned, you are inspired by Schumpeter, who defined democracy as a system for arriving at political decisions in which individuals acquire the power to decide by means of a competitive struggle for the people's vote. But in your writings, you've also pointed out that that doesn't mean that it can be any government. Governments must actually be able to govern competently. So that minimalist definition requires that there's some sort of efficient, competent government in place. So that's one thing. How do you then view the more substantive forms of democracy that a lot of people say are important? It's not just elections. You need something more. It's not just the minimum levels of freedom, but the more sort of broader sets of challenges that we need to address in terms of climate change, poverty, etc., requires a longer list of things that should be added. What is your view on that? My approach here is to distinguish. People sort of stick in to notions of democracy, all kinds of substantive goals. And there are many writings which say that unless democracy produces this or that, then it's not a democracy. My strategy always has been analytical. That is, I thought we should distinguish. We should ask. So suppose that governments are selected and replaced by reasonably free and competitive elections. What should we expect of this mechanism? Should we expect that it's going to produce rational decisions? Should we expect that this will produce governments which are responsible to voters' preferences? Should we expect that it's going to produce economic development? Should we expect this to reduce inequality? But these for me are analytical and empirical questions, which can be posed if and only if we don't stick everything into the definition. Once we stick everything in the definition, we don't know what to do next. 
So basically, it is about what is a democracy versus whether democracy is a good or a bad thing, right? Well, what is a democracy in this minimalist sense? Mechanism for processing conflicts through elections. And then what does it generate? What should we expect it to generate? Yeah. I spent a large part of my life thinking about transitions to democracy during the time when the world was uh, governed by many nasty dictatorships. The Sacrisis participated in this big project on transitions to democracy. And democracy was something that we didn't have. And everybody expected that once we have democracy, then we're going to get everything else. We're going to get accountability, development, equality, and everything else. Well, a lot of these expectations were bitterly disappointed. We used to joke that you know this process is going to go through stages. There is liberalization, transition, and then the solution, <laughs> yeah. which is what influenced my research agenda very much. Yes, it became important for me to start asking, so what should we reasonably expecting of democracy? Because uh, unrealistic expectations are politically dangerous. Here, I think it is particularly interesting to distinguish between democracy and freedom. Democracy and freedom do not necessarily enjoy a directly proportional relationship, and maximizing both can be a challenge. And I think I remember reading something that you wrote in the year 2000, where you argue that whereas democracy is a system of political rights, these are definitional. It is not a system that necessarily furnishes the conditions for effective exercise of these rights. Yes, well, democracy is a system of equal political rights. And um, there I follow actually, well, probably Marx in 1846, but also Rosen, Pierre Rosenvallon, the French political historian, yes? When people become citizens, when they acquire this bundle of rights associated with citizenship, they become indistinguishable as citizens. There are no fat citizens and thin citizens, rich citizens and poor citizens, black citizens and white citizens, yes. Citizens are, to use the title of a classical Austrian novel, they are people without qualities. They don't have any other quality other than being citizens. But the moment they become political actors, then all of these other characteristics, which become anonymized when you become a citizen, start mattering. Rich people have better conditions for all kinds of actions than poor people. And maybe in some societies, black people have fewer possibilities of exercising their rights than white people. So while this concept of political rights, the concept of citizenship, makes us anonymous. In real life, we're not anonymous. We still have all these qualities, and these qualities determine the extent to which we can exercise these rights. There is a very nice book by Cass Sunstein and Stephen Holmes, The Cost of Rights. Yes. Rights have to be capacitated in order to be able to be exercised. And we know, I mean, in most countries, there is just a very simple correlation between income and voting, for example. This reminds me of Isaiah Berlin's distinction between positive and negative liberty. That's correct. In many societies, it's not just enough to have a democracy, but to facilitate people to actually exercise those rights. There's education, health, jobs, etc. So those enabling conditions are important. Well, yeah, this is sort of the contradiction of liberalism. That is, uh, you give everybody, everybody has political rights. And at the same time, liberals think that we should reduce the role of the state. But in order to be able to exercise rights, we need the state. The state has enabled the exercise of these rights. On this, by the way, I strongly recommend the writings of my colleague, Stephen Holmes. He's a liberal who understands that rights are empty unless the state creates the conditions for their exercise. I will put a, a little uh, show note with the link to his work. Going back to the idea of a minimalist definition, and given that you live in the United States, 
there's always this tension between a minimalist state and a more substantive state. And there are all of these debates, how much should the state regulate our lives? So when you propose, say, a minimalist definition of democracy, are you then assuming that a democracy will be classified according to the minimalist criteria and then evolve into some sort of a strong state structure that provides the incentives for citizens to exercise those rights? Is, is there some sort of a sequential movement you see? Well, I call it minimalist, my view of democracy. It's minimalist. It's not that minimalist in the following sense. So think of Robert Dahl's view of democracy, which in the end is very similar to mine, but he says democracy is possible if and only if, and he actually has seven conditions for it, including effective exercise of rights. So for that mechanism, which I have in mind, which in the end for me is that the government lose elections, that entails a lot of conditions, preconditions, including political freedom, including some conditions for people to be able to exercise their rights, free press. So some conditions are entailed in our capacity to act politically, select governments and remove governments. Talking about Dahl, one of my favorite pieces is one where he says that elections are not the start of a process, but the culmination of many rights that are gradually institutionalized and that elections come towards the end of that process of institutionalization. Do you agree with that? Well, I completely agree with that. That actually goes back to Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist, who says, you know, the counting of the votes is only the final stage of a long process in which, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So there are preconditions. This relationship between democracy and freedom, I mean, Schumpeter is very good at it. It's, he is on many other topics. Yes. He says democracy may reinforce freedoms, but freedom is a precondition for democracy. Unless people are free to vote and free to exercise their rights, we cannot have democracy. So it's not as much of an effect as a condition for. In recent years, of course, some of the big problems or the debates on democracy has revolved around minority rights. And even as we speak, India, the world's largest electoral democracy, is struggling with that. And in your works, you've also referred to some of the debates that have been characterized as being illiberal democracy debates. I recall that you've written previously, I think in the book, The Crisis of Democracy, you write that to govern effectively, governments must satisfy a majority and yet not ignore the views of intense minorities. How is that, in your view, playing out today? Where are the problems? Why is it that many large democracies face precisely that issue, consider that to be a big problem, to address the needs of these intense minorities? The question of why is it true today, I will immediately say, I don't know. I've spent my time on it, as you know. We do see people call backsliding, erosion, retrogression of democracies in some countries around the world. Now, I'm not one of these people who say there is a generalized world crisis of democracy. I don't think so. There are a lot of countries where democracy is functioning quite well. Germany, maybe Korea, Chile. So it, it's, it's not that I think there's sort of a universal crisis of democracy. I think if you look at it carefully, what you will find is that the number of you know, backsliding governments has increased around the world. And 
political polarization, which inclines some political forces not to respect the results of elections, that phenomenon also increased in some countries around the world. So the number of such countries has increased recently, but it doesn't mean that the whole world is going in that direction. I, I don't know how technical I can be, but if you plotted the distribution of, sort of governments which are backsliding and not backsliding, I don't think that the average number has increased. I think that they're kind of more of them exist at the tail of this distribution. And you know, India is one of them, and my native country, Poland, is another one of them. I think we should distinguish two different situations. One is the backsliding governments of quote unquote populist governments. These are governments which are subverting democracy with the support of majorities. Majorities are getting either material or symbolic goods, which people value, and people are willing to close their eyes to transgressions of, against democracy by the government in exchange for getting what they want. Scholar, political scientist at Yale, Milan Spolik has beautiful evidence about the United States in which he shows that voters are willing to tolerate democratic transgressions in exchange of getting desirable policy outcomes. So that's one type of situation. Another type of situation is that we're getting polarization, which means that losers of elections are not willing to tolerate electoral defeats resulting from application of existing rules. And the United States is obviously a primary example. Uh, what's gonna happen in Brazil in a few months is very unclear. So uh, there are kind of two dangers of democracy. Yes. One is uh, quote unquote populism and two is quote unquote polarization. So where do you see minority rights coming in here? Uh, look, this language of minority rights is so much ideologically cloaked that unraveling it is not easy. What were the minority rights when the first republics, because they were not democracies, were created? What were the minorities? The minority rights were the rights of the properties and the entire systems of representative government were designed to protect the status quo by all kinds of super majoritarian or anti-majoritarian devices. And the status quo was private property of means of production and concentration of wealth in some hands. Now, when we say minority rights, we basically think in terms of, well, we used to think in terms of poor people who are never a minority, then we thought of women who were never a minority as they are 51% of the world population. But now we're beginning to think of smaller and smaller minorities, very often defined by the criteria of Americans, badly called diversity, yes? <laughs> Basically, our phenotypes, yes? Our skin colors and maybe sexual preferences. And so that language has completely evolved. Now, what is new in there is the concept of quote unquote liberal democracy. And basically, what does that mean? People say elections are not enough. You also need quote unquote something called rule of law. Pierre Jose Vallon, their noisy proponent of this view. Some of the people you interviewed are also noisy proponents <laughs> of this view, which basically says, uh, Jose Vallon says, I'm always quoting, these days we do not consider as a democracy a system which does not have some mechanisms of constraining majority, some anti-majoritarian or contra-majoritarian mechanisms. Now, that for me is pure ideology. It's the dominant ideology. Everybody uses this term. We need, quote unquote, the rule of law, and which means we need some super majoritarian or contra majoritarian devices. Now, there is one, there are very good logical arguments 
that that is not necessary. And two, there is not a shred of evidence for that kind of assertion. I mean, the idea that more majoritarian systems, one, are more likely to violate minority rights, and two, as these people claim that majoritarian governments lead to larger policy swings, there is not a shred of evidence in their support. Just think of it this way. Probably the most majoritarian system in the world until very recently, Sweden, unicameral legislation, nobody can veto the decisions of the legislature. There was no judicial review. Sweden violates minority rights. Sweden has large swings in policy. And the same is true statistically, the best point I, I know. The claim that you need to constrain somehow from the outside the rule of majority in order to protect minority rights and in order to avoid policy swings is no foundation. That's pure ideology. Maybe there is quite a lot of focus on this democracy backsliding, or as my friend Larry Diamond calls it, democratic recession. And all of these reports by Freedom House, VDEM, and all of these reports saying basically that there are fewer democracies now than before, and we should be concerned. Some of this, of course, and I'd like to hear your views on this, is because of lower quality democracy. It's, it's maybe setting the bar high and then saying that they have regressed, that there are certain things that they were doing well, they're not doing as well now. If I'm understanding you correctly, you're basically saying if you adopt the kind of minimalist definition of democracy as you do, then all of this talk about regression, recession, backsliding is not that important. Have I understood you correctly? No, look, I think it's important. I'm not saying that. I think that what's happened in uh, Venezuela, Poland, Hungary, India, that's dangerous. It's dangerous to democracy. In what sense does it danger? I think that the erosion of democracy, whatever you call it, has two dimensions. One is that the incumbent governments basically make themselves impossible to be replaced. They take all kinds of steps, some obviously anti-democratic and some kind of uh, that seem democratic, but which have the effect of just making it impossible for them to be replaced. Even if you know, they lose elections like Maduro does, then they have a referendum which overrides the result of the election. Why is that dangerous? Well, because what is democracy? It is uh, our capacity to choose the government and then to remove the ones we don't like. So democracy is in danger because that capacity is in danger. And the second dimension, which is different, which is that these governments also increase their discretion in policymaking. That is, they begin to take decisions which previously they could not have been taken unilaterally, that previously required some elaborate process to be effective. So yes, so I think that the dangers are there. I just don't think that these dangers are universal. Mm -hmm. Spain has all kinds of conflicts, the Catalan conflict and whatnot, but it's a healthy, vibrant democracy. And so is Germany. So uh, I, I don't think that is true everywhere. I don't know why it's occurring now, but let me make one observation, which is, so we have this populist critique or populist onslaught. What is the populist onslaught is, you know, the language is that uh, we're ruled by an elite and we cannot do anything against, against that, that we have what the Spanish called casta, the caste, economic, political caste which is then opposed to the people and people have to somehow conquer their power. Now, this language appeared in history every so often, but that is very popular and very widespread. As I see it, there is a lot of reason to that critique. If you start thinking about, well, let me put it this way. One cannot, as many of these critics of populism maintain, one cannot at the same time bemoan the populist critique and lament about inequality. 
if our representative institutions work the way they should have worked, the way they were expected to work, we would not have had the inequality that we do. So there is something real in there. Now, I, I think the solutions are either pointless or dangerous, but the critique, the populist critique of representative institutions, I think has a big grain of salt in it. In your work with your uh, ex-doctoral student, Fernando Limongi, you find that the probability of democracy surviving increases steeply as income in the country rises. And that no democracy in a country with per capita incomes higher than of either Argentina in 1976 or Thailand in 2006 yes. have ever collapsed. So we are talking about 69 consolidated democracies lasting a total of 1,957 years with incomes higher than that of Thailand in 2006, and none of these actually fell. Is that how you would mainly characterize the relationship between democracy and development, that it is one of rapidly increasing incomes, that economic growth was much slower in democracies that fell than in those that survived? How would you characterize that relationship between democracy and economic development as you see it today? This is a relationship with, which goes it both ways, two ways. So one question is uh, whether democracy is more likely to survive and to function peacefully in wealthier, more developed countries. That's one side of the question. The other side of the question is, whether democracies are conducive to faster development. That is where there are two causal relations from development to democracy, from democracy to development. Now, in my work with Fernando Limongi, yes, we did find that no democracy ever fell in the country with per capita income higher than that of Argentina in 1976. And since then, Thailand has somewhat higher income. And there, I go back to, to democracy as a system for processing conflict, which is that um, under standard economic assumptions, the intensity of conflict should decrease when people have higher incomes. Why? Because yes, if, if the political conflict is, should we have a lower tax rate or higher tax rate? For people with higher incomes, that potential difference in their incomes, whether one party wins or another party wins, makes a difference for them. So through, through that mechanism, what I call the stakes in elections become lower with per capita income. But I have to put a caveat to it. I, I am shaken by what happened in the United States in uh, 2020. I'm shaken by that because uh, that should not have happened according to my research. I'm sorry, shaken by what? What aspect of the election? Shaken by the fact that this country came to a brink to, of a coup d'etat. Look, this is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Two, this is a country which had 22 peaceful changes of presidencies between parties in its history. And when you combine the income and what I call habituation, that is the past of democracy, you would expect that elections should just work absolutely automatically, smoothly. When I apply my statistical models to the United States, the probability that a loser of an election in the United States would not obey the outcome, the one I calculated to be one in 1.6 million. So something is wrong with my thinking. The world must have, may have changed, but I'm just totally puzzled by what's happening, what happened, and what probably will happen in this country. And 
it is fascinating to see every day new books coming out from former Trump administration officials, including the latest one by the defense secretary, the former defense secretary, about all the antics, all the efforts by Trump's administration to prevent him from making all of these very dictatorial decisions. Yes, yes. yes. It's breast, look, it's breasting. And it, it takes me by surprise, and I say that It's not lightly because it makes me doubt about my understanding of the world and many of my previous results. Something here is different. Something here is new. And I can't quite figure out. Could it be inequality? Because while you're talking about incomes at a a national level, within countries, there is, of course, much more dissatisfaction about rising inequality, income inequality, which many attribute to Brexit or Brexit took place and Trump came to power because of this dissatisfaction with globalization, with inequality. Do you subscribe to some of those explanations? You know, you've read my book, so you've seen it. There are so many candidates for explanations. There are, you know, call this stagnation of income, reduction of intergenerational mobility. This is something that really strikes me. You know, if you ask Americans and Europeans today whether they expect that their offspring will be better off financially than they were, it's 64% in Europe and 60% in the United States say no. That really shakes me because just from the Industrial Revolution on, from the 1820s, we've acquired this belief in progress. And that meant our children will be better off than we are. So the fact that this is shaken is important. But anyway, I'm digressing. So you have all kinds of economic explanation. But then you also have all kinds of cultural or psychological explanation. In reactions to immigration, the threat to our traditional way of life, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the conclusions I draw from having read hundreds of these studies is we just can't tell which it is. When you look at these studies, everything matters a little bit, but nothing matters very much. So I'm just agnostic about causes. There are too many potential candidates for causes which we cannot reject. I want to return to this core idea that you've also mentioned here, but it's also in the book, democracy as a way of processing conflicts. I think there's something there that we could further delve into, because in the book, you write about how political institutions manage conflicts in an orderly way by structuring the way social antagonisms are organized politically absorbing whatever conflicts may threaten public order and regulating them according to some rules. So institutions are in place. There needs to be trust. We need to trust our representatives to resolve these conflicts. There's some predictability to these conflicts being resolved. And conflicts are orderly, you write, if all political forces expect that they may achieve something at the present or at least in some not too distant future by processing their interests within the institutional framework while they see little to be gained by actions outside the institutional realm. I think that is really the crucial point here that maybe what is happening in the United States is that lack of trust in that institutional framework that maybe political polarization has led to total lack of trust. You can't expect a president or count on the president leaving office, even though he or she may lose the election. And this goes back to your original definition of democracy. I have to say that claim that I was really prescient because When Trump got elected in 2016, very soon after, he said, the only possible way I could lose the next election is by fraud. You know, he said that, I think, a few months after he was elected. Yeah. And that scared the hell out of me already. Yes. 
And Bolsonaro in Brazil is saying exactly the same. That really scared me. Why? Because that's precisely was kind of a bomb under the trust in the institutions that regulate conflict. I mean, Republicans today in the United States are in this kind of a paradoxical situation. At the same time, they say, you know, elections were stolen. We cannot trust the elections. Go and vote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is what they're doing. And uh, there was just an election in uh, Georgia, primary election. That's yes. exactly the language. But yes, they have undermined uh, trust in the institutions. But you know, there is another aspect to it, which for me is very important, which is in the passage that you've read. And that is the problem is that conflicts are not structured by intermediating institutions. And that mainly means political parties. We used to have political parties and the political parties were pretty much vertical organizations. People express their demands, their dissatisfactions, their protests through the parties and the trade unions. And that's, I think, what be, has become eroded. This stru structuring of conflicts through the parties. So now conflicts are kind of between, quote unquote, the masses of the people or whatnot, and the, the politicians, not regs, absorbed, structured through political parties. That, that's, I think, the most striking thing of Western Europe, that if you look at the electoral fate of the traditional parties, center-left and center-right, they have really been weakened. So I think it, things have become kind of fragmented and chaotic. I think one of the biggest sort of takeaways I got from your book is that democracy works well when the stakes entailed in institutionalized conflicts are neither too small or too large. And I think that provides a very useful starting point to understand whether if the stakes are too big, the guardrails come off. Elections cannot produce a situation in which the defeat is intolerable. Yeah. So the stakes cannot be too big. They cannot be too small because then people conclude the elections make no difference. Then you know, why bother? So yes, I very much believe they have to be intermediate. And the second condition for me for successful functioning of democracy is that the losers of today have some chances of winning in the future, yes? Let's look at the African continent. I've been studying many of those countries. What typically happens is you could have democracy on paper, what Asimoglu Robinson called paper leviathans, that they project power. It looks like everything is okay. A democratic election has taken place. And after four or five years, they lose the election. And there are widespread reports of corruption, human rights abuses, whatever. It could be not just Africa. It could be anywhere in the world. And so it makes sense for the new regime to somehow prosecute the previous leaders, rightly or wrongly, but this leads to this allegation that this is, you know, witch hunting. And, and so then automatically, Adam, the stakes become too big. Yeah, again, I agree. I, I think that going after defeated presidents or defeated politicians is very dangerous because what does it mean? It means that people who are in power now are afraid that that's going to happen to them. And they'll try to stick to power by any means. You know, I was very influenced, I said this often, I was very influenced by a conversation I had with a Polish communist reformer in Warsaw in 1987 or 1986, something like this. He's a very close friend of mine, he was my teacher. And we're walking and he said one time, you know, we are thinking of having a competitive election. And I said to him, but if you're actually going to lose, to which his reply was, you know, it's not really whether we lose or win that matters, but what we will lose. And he meant, you know, doesn't mean that we're going to be killed, go to jail, that our property will be confiscated, or does it just mean that we're going to go into opposition and continue our political and private activities. Yes. 
unless unless you have that expectation, the expectation that if you lose, nothing much is going to happen to you. Unless you have the expectation, democracy cannot work. That also means that if you know that nothing bad is going to happen to you, you should also behave in that same way when you are in power. Exactly, but exactly, exactly, exactly. This is why I think that habituation matters, yes? Because, you know, if you've been in power for a long time and then allow yourself to have an election, you don't know if you lose, you don't know what these other people are going to do to you. I mean, think of Putin, even before the war. He could not not lose any election because if you lost an election, he'd be thrown out through the window, yes? So the incentive of staying on is greater when you are threatened. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. This is why I think the stakes cannot be too large. You mentioned Poland, and Poland, of course, frequently crops up in these debates on democratic recession, backsliding, together with Hungary and many other countries. When you think about your childhood, I saw a tweet where you, in February of this year, said you recall when you were four years old, a bomb falling I, I don't know where in Poland it was. I, I believe it is Warsaw. Yes. When you saw what is happening, when you see what's happening in the Ukraine, that you were reminded of, of something similar. So this brings me to the final set of issues about whether democracy is really in a crisis. You argue that, well, we need to first be clear what constitutes a crisis. Is there like a checklist? So if you could first say something about what should we be looking for? Is there a one to 10 sort of checklist that we could tick off and say, hmm, if this country is doing this and that, this is heading towards a crisis. Is there a universal kind of an idea in your view of what a crisis should look like? Well, you know, there is a sort of a checklist that in my book, I create a selective checklist of that kind, yes. Well, I I think that it's important that there be institutions that absorb and process conflict. And more than that, these institutions have to be able to discipline their supporters. That is, yes, they have to be able to say, come and do it, but they also have to come and be able to say, don't do it anymore. Yeah. That is, they have to be able to demobilize, not only mobilize, because otherwise you can have sort of a gene coming out of a bottle that's no longer controllable, which may be happening with Trump in the United States. Yes. So I think that that's a very important indication. My understanding, Adam, when I study development and democracy is that there is so high expectations in many parts of the world, and this goes back to our how we started the conversation, on what democracy will bring. There is the idea that any transition from a non-democratic setup to a democracy is going to usher in development, is going to usher in progress. Lives are going to be radically changed. And when that doesn't happen in the first 5, 10, 15, 20 years, people get upset. They are disappointed. And so this brings me to what I really enjoyed reading in the book, among many things, is when you write, democracy may still be, and I believe it is, the least bad way of organizing our lives as a collectivity, but any political arrangement faces limits as to what they can achieve, and democracies are no different. Are we putting too much pressure on democracy to deliver? Oh, I, I think we definitely do, and I think it's dangerous. My political agenda, I have a little book which which is called Why Bother With Elections, that was actually translated in about 10 languages. My intention is exactly that. My intention is to say, look, here is what we can reasonably expect, and here is what we cannot expect. And it's dangerous to expect more than any system can deliver. I mean, democracies function in societies. No government can trans- completely transform a society. The limitations are there. For one, democracies function in capitalist societies, and the, the power of economic entities cannot be ignored. The political power of quote unquote the market 
cannot be ignored. Every government has to anticipate. So there are limits to what democracy can achieve. And some function better and some function worse, yes. But it's within those limits. I'm even more kind of a little bit maybe cynical. People tend to blame governments for everything. <laughs> when, they, when they are unhappy about something, often they say, oh, it's you know, the government, even though it may have nothing to do with the government or there are things about which governments can do nothing. Okay? So yes, yes, cool of expectations, which doesn't mean that we should close our eyes to reforms that are possible. I'm not saying, you know, just be passive, accept things as they are. We have to constantly think about how to improve democracies. What about Poland? What is the future of democracy in Poland? I think that the future of democracy in Poland is uh, that it's going to huff and puff, but nothing dramatic is going to occur. And there, the influence of Europe is very important. Europe just forced Poland to dismantle sort of a nasty institution through which the government was trying to control judges. Poland is facing a choice of being in Europe, not being in Europe. And the constraint of being in Europe is so strong that they cannot go too far. They try everything they, they can. You know, they throw money around every time there's a little political crisis, trying to buy people off. They play with all the nasty symbols. But I don't think anything dramatic is going to happen. You've been one of my heroes. I've really learned a lot from reading your work. And this was such a pleasure to have you on the show. So thank you very much. It was a wonderful conversation. I very much enjoyed. Thank you. If you enjoyed this conversation, please spread the news among friends and colleagues and share the link to the podcast on social media. You can tag us on Twitter at Global Dev Pod and Dan Bannock. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to in pursuit of development at gmail.com.